It was last summer when a college freshman from China, his name is Zhu, he was arrested after staging his own kidnapping. According to the police report, the 18-year-old ran out of money during his summer travels, but rather than just going out and finding a job, he asked some friends of his to help him create a fake ransom note complete with pictures of his captivity. And then on July 13th, 2017, Zhu's parents received the ransom note, which assured them that they needed to produce $15,000 within an hour in order to secure the safe return of their son. Well, rather than rushing to pay the ransom note, they wisely called the police, and the police, after their investigation, quickly discovered that their son, Zhu, and two of his friends had faked the entire thing. After his arrest, well, Zhu admitted that he had staged the kidnapping, and when asked why, he confessed to the cops that he wasn't really sure if his father actually loved him. He didn't really know if his dad really loved him. And somewhere in his young teenage mind, he concluded that the payment of this ransom would prove to him his father's love. Well, thankfully for him, his father did love him. And his father loved him so much that he was very quick to forgive his son's deception. The proof of that could be seen in the fact that his father went and posted his son's bail so that he could bring his son home. And it's in a similar and yet spiritual way that every believer here today can rejoice in knowing that we have a heavenly father who loves us. We have a God who loves us so much that uh, he was willing to pay our ransom. He was willing to post our bail so that we could come to his heavenly home. Here in our time today, we're going to consider the way in which our Heavenly Father has demonstrated his love for us by paying the ransom which was required for our redemption. And as we make our way through our text before us today, we'll soon see that the ransom of redemption results in our judicial justification. Secondly, we'll learn that the ransom of redemption results in our spiritual sanctification. And then thirdly and finally, we'll see that the ransom of redemption results in our physical glorification. Well, with this as our outline, let's open our Bibles to Hebrews chapter 9. Here we find Paul helping his Hebrew audience to understand the ransom of eternal redemption. And as you make your way to Hebrews 9, I want to take a moment to put our text back into its context. It'll first help you to remember that Paul began this chapter by revealing the truth of the tabernacle. And as we examined the first 15 verses of this chapter, we learned about the way in which the tabernacle that Moses made was actually prepared as a prophetic picture which pointed us forward to the Messiah. We also learned that the tabernacle was created to serve as a structure which was symbolic of our Savior and pointed us towards our salvation. And then finally, we learned that the tabernacle was fulfilled through our messianic mediator who is Christ Jesus the Lord. I should also remind you that the, this fulfillment, which is found in Jesus Christ, it results in eternal redemption for those who trust in Jesus. As a matter of fact, I, I would direct your attention back to our text last week. It was Hebrews 9, verse 12, where Paul assures his Hebrew audience that the Lord Jesus has obtained eternal redemption, which he, uh, on, on that day when he entered the most holy place, with his own blood. He obtained for us eternal redemption through the shedding of his blood. And then Paul went further in verse 15 to explain that Christ Jesus is our messianic mediator and he has provided for us redemption from the transgressions under the first covenant so that those who trust in him can receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. Clearly, Paul is wanting us to understand the redemption, the eternal redemption that the Lord Jesus secured for us through his death. And now here in the second half of this chapter, we find Paul, he's continuing this conversation. He's continuing to explain how we can receive eternal redemption. And so he presents the original recipients of this epistle with a description of the way in which the redemptive work of our Redeemer has set us free from the judicial condemnation of the old covenant law. Now, those who trust in Jesus, we receive redemption through the remission of sins, which results in our judicial justification. And with this as our focus, I want to consider how Paul puts it here in Hebrews chapter 9. 
If you would, let's pick up our study of Hebrews 9. There at verse 16, here Paul declares, For where there is a testament, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is in force after men are dead, since it has no power at all while the testator lives. Therefore, not even the first covenant was dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats with water, scarlet wool, and hyssop, and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you. Then likewise he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And according to the law... Almost all things are purified with blood. And without shedding of blood, there is no remission. Here in these verses we find Paul. He's continuing to help his Hebrew audience to understand how the Lord Jesus has fulfilled the Old Testament symbolism of the sacrificial system which was taking place there at the tabernacle that Moses made. And Jesus has fulfilled all of this symbolism through the death of himself. He, he, Paul here is reminding them about the way in which it was necessary for the blood of Jesus to be shed in order to secure the remission of sins for the people of God. Now, oh, it's important to understand that the word remission, that word remission found there at the end of verse 22, it's translated from a Greek word which refers to a judicial pardon from the punishment or the penalty of punishments. And so, more simply put, the remission of sins, it's the freedom that comes from forgiveness. The person who receives the remission of sins has been freed from the penalty of punishment that we deserve, and we receive this through the forgiveness of God. A modern example of this can be seen in what's known as a presidential pardon. The president has the power to pardon those who were previously convicted of a crime. And one example of this can be seen uh, in, in the president's pardon of a conservative pundit named Dinesh D'Souza. He was convicted back in 2014 of a campaign finance violation. And thankfully for him, well, President Trump decided that he had been a victim of selective prosecution. And with that being the case, it was last May when the president determined that Mr. D'Souza is fully worthy of a presidential pardon. Since then, Dinesh has received a remission of the crimes. He's received a forgiveness for those crimes that he had been previously convicted of, and now he's uh, been restored. Uh, he's received the full restoration of all of his civil rights, which had been taken away from him. This is a, a, a picture of the sort of remission of sins that we receive because much like the president who has the power to pardon a previous conviction, listen, the Lord Jesus has the power to pardon our sins. The Lord Jesus is the mediator who has secured for us the remission of sins so that we can receive a pardon. And listen, the Lord Jesus is a merciful mediator. And the reason why I say he's merciful is based on the fact that we don't deserve to be pardoned. You might not know that, but I'm here to tell you. We do not deserve to be pardoned. Let's be honest about it. Let's, let's just be, you know, just very transparent right now. We are all completely guilty before God. And those who want to come before God on the basis of what we deserve are going to be sadly disappointed as they realize that what we deserve is God's wrath. That's what we deserve from God, his wrath. We don't deserve to be pardoned at all. And so I say that Jesus is a merciful mediator because though we don't deserve it, he has provided us with the opportunity to receive the remission of sins. He did this by providing us with the possibility of a pardon through the redemptive work that he accomplished there on the cross. Or more simply put, our forgiveness was secured by his sacrifice. Let's consider how Paul puts it here in Hebrews chapter 9. If you would, let's back up and look again at verse 16. There in Hebrews 9 verse 16, Paul declares, For where there is a testament, there must also of necessity be the death 
of the testator, for a testament is in force after men are dead, since it has no power at all while the testator lives. Now, for the sake of clarity, it's important to note that the word testament here, it's translated from the same Greek word which was rendered covenant back in Hebrews 7 and 8. When you see the word covenant uh, and, the, and the word testament, they both come from the same Greek word. And while the original Greek word typically speaks of a contract which defines the terms and the conditions of an agreement, uh, the same Greek word would also be used when referring to the legal document by which a, a person, that is the testator, would express their wishes as to how their wealth should be distributed and divided up at the time of their death. This is what we refer to as a last will and testament. One weird example of a last will and testament can be seen in the way that the, the wealth of a Portuguese man named Luis Carlos was distributed amongst 70 strangers. This childless aristocrat, he randomly chose 70 names out of a Lisbon phone directory 13 years before he died. 13 years before he died, he just opened up the phone book and just chose 70 people. How incredible is that? Then in 2007, the last will and testament of Luis Carlos was read and enforced. And it was at that moment when his wealth was equally divided amongst the 70 individuals that he had picked from the phone book 13 years prior. And many of them, well, they suspected that it was nothing more than a scam. They thought it was a scam, but they soon realized that actually the death of Luis Carlos had actually made them rich. And that's incredible, especially as I consider this email that I got yesterday from a, a Nigerian man who assures me that uh, the inheritance of his dead relative is mine for the taking. All I got to do is send him, you know, 500 bucks. Considering doing that, it sounds like a pretty good deal. Seriously, though, the death of Luis Carlos made these 70 people wealthy. And it's in a similar yet spiritual way that the death of Jesus Christ has made the believer spiritually wealthy. He's provided us with the possibility of a pardon according to his last will and testament. You see, his last will and testament includes a provision for the remission of our sins. This was precisely the point that the Lord Jesus was making when he presented his disciples with that grail of grape juice at the Last Supper. And it was at that moment when the Lord declared, this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many, for what? For the remission of sins, for the pardoning of sins. This is the blood of the new covenant, which is shed for the forgiveness of sins. The last will and testament of Jesus provides us with the possibility of pardon through the shedding of his blood. And in order to prove his point, Paul reminds his readers about the symbolic sacrifices which were offered under the first covenant. And with this as our focus, let's consider how Paul puts it. If you would look with me again there at verse 18. Here again, Paul declares, not even the first covenant was dedicated without blood. That word dedicated well, it can also be rendered introduced or, or it could also be rendered initiated. Not even the first covenant or what we might, might call the Old Testament, not even the Old Testament was initiated without blood. Or in other words, the Old Covenant was initiated with the shedding of blood. This points back to the day when Moses first presented the terms and conditions of that first covenant to the people of God. Once they agreed to the terms and the conditions of that covenant, Moses then initiated the covenant by offering burnt offerings and peace offerings of oxen to the Lord. And here in Hebrews 9, Paul reminds us how Moses then used the blood of those sacrifices to confirm and dedicate and initiate this covenant. With this as our focus, look with me there at verse 19. Here, Paul points back to the book of Exodus by writing, for when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats with water, scarlet wool and hyssop, and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, this is the blood of the covenant which God commanded you. Now, here in these verses, we find Paul, he's pointing back to this day when Moses initiated and dedicated the old covenant with the blood of calves and goats. In the original account, you can read it for homework. It's found in Exodus chapter 24, 
This account presents us with the details of that day when Moses took the book of the covenant and he read it in the hearing of the people. He took the entire, all the details of the old covenant law, he took it and he read it word for word, line by line, precept upon precept. He read it all in the hearing of the people. This wasn't like, you know, some Apple account agreement that you just scroll down to the bottom and say, accept before even reading one word of it. Well, you know, we all do that. Don't even know what the, what the contract is we're agreeing to. We could be giving away our first child as far as we know. You know, I don't know, just give me the service, accept, right? Well, that's not the way they did it. They read the entire covenant, the entire agreement, all the terms and conditions that God was giving to them. Moses read it in the hearing of the people. And according to Moses, the people then confirmed this covenant by declaring all that the Lord has said, we will do and be obedient. Yeah, good luck with that. But after they hit the accept button, it was at that moment when, when Moses initiated the old covenant. And he did this by sprinkling the blood of the sacrifice on the book of the covenant as well as on the people of God. According to Paul, Moses then confirmed this covenant by declaring this is the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made with you according to all these words. And, and then after sprinkling the blood uh, sprinkling, uh, sprinkling the, the blood on the people, and, and Moses then went further and sprinkled the, the blood on the tabernacle as well as all of the furnishings once those were all created. As a matter of fact, look with me there at Hebrews 9 verse 21 because here Paul declares then likewise he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry, according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood and without shedding of blood. There is no remission. Here in these verses, we find Paul helping his Hebrew audience to realize that Moses, he initiated the old covenant with the sprinkling of blood. And the reason why, well, it's based on the fact that the law of the old covenant requires that almost everything be purified with the blood of a sacrifice. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. Without the shedding of blood, there is no pardon, no forgiveness of sins. And with that being the case, it was necessary for the new covenant, the new testament, to be consecrated with the blood of a better sacrifice. This is precisely the point that Paul goes on to make here in verse 23. Uh, look with me there at verse 23 where he assures us that it was necessary that the copies of the things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. It was necessary for Moses to purify the earthly copies of heavenly things with the blood of a sacrifice, and so how much more so the heavenly things themselves? Remember the the earthly tabernacle, the, the earthly furniture, the, 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 the temporary sacrifices, these were all symbols pointing to a savior who would come and offer up his own blood for the remission of sins. The copies, they were just symbolic pictures of the way that the Lord Jesus would offer himself as a sinless sacrifice so that the new covenant could be consecrated according to the law of the old covenant. Therefore, the new covenant, legally speaking, had to be consecrated, initiated, and dedicated through the sinless sacrifice of Jesus so it could be sanctified by the blood of Christ. In order to further grasp this incredible truth, if you would hold your place here in the book of Hebrews and turn with me to the book of Colossians, I'd like you to turn with me to Colossians chapter one. And as you make your way to the first chapter of Colossians, I wanna take a moment to remind you that those who break the commandments of God are deserving of death. You might not know that. And we can tend to downplay our own crimes and sins before God and think, well, you know, I haven't ever murdered anybody, so I'm not really deserving of death, am I? Yes, you are. If you break the commandments, you are deserving of death. Paul put it very plainly when he told the Christians in Rome that the wages of sin are death. Think about that for a moment. You go to work and you perform your responsibilities there at work, all with the goal of at the end of the week or at the end of the month, however you get paid, you're looking for the wages that you earned from all the work that you did. 
and you're looking for some cash at the end, which you deserve for all the days that you showed up and, and, and did all these tasks. You're looking for the paycheck, the wages of your work. Well, according to Paul, the wages of sin is death, the paycheck that you get at the end of the day. For all the sins that you've committed, it's death. What does God owe you but a paycheck that equals death? Those who are guilty of sin have been given the death penalty and that's bad news for every single one of us because we've all sinned and we've all fallen short of God's glory. And with that being the case, the question that we really ought to be asking is this, how can the Lord pardon the sins of those who deserve the death penalty? I mean, if you know someone and they're sitting on death row and they actually deserve to be there, who is gonna think, oh, let's, let's figure out a way to pardon that person? How does God pardon the sins of those who actually deserve the death penalty? And the answer is by carrying out our death sentence on his only begotten son so that he can be just and the justifier of those who trust in him. Let's consider how Paul explains it here in Colossians chapter one. If you would look with me here, beginning at verse 13, Paul declares, he has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the son of his love in whom we have redemption. How? Through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. The redemption which results in our forgiveness, the redemption which comes from our remission of sins was secured through the blood of Jesus Christ. And I'll remind you that Jesus didn't just go down to the blood bank and give a pint. We're not talking about how he just gave a little blood and now we're good, right? No, his blood was shed. His blood was entirely poured out. And according to the Old Testament, the life of every living thing is in the blood. So when his blood was shed, his life was given. He gave his life for us. Jesus gave his life so that our death sentence could be served on him. So that God could remain just while simultaneously justifying those who trust in him. So we see then that God is able to pardon our sins, not just because he's this merciful God who just looks the other way. Then he would have to deny his justice and he can't deny himself. He can't not be who he is. And he is a just judge. Therefore, he must punish every single sin. But he's also a loving God, a merciful God who wanted to pardon us. And so he sent his only begotten son to receive the punishment that we deserve. And now that he's paid our ransom, well, those who trust in him can be judicially justified, which means it's just as if I'd never sinned. We can be judicially justified, being redeemed through the remission of sins, which is the pardon and the forgiveness that we receive by faith in Jesus Christ. And listen, the ransom of redemption not only results in our judicial justification, but the ransom of our redemption also results in our spiritual sanctification. And with this as our focus, let's make our way back to Hebrews chapter nine, because here we find Paul, he's continuing to describe the way in which the Lord Jesus has redeemed us through his substitutionary sacrifice. If you would, let's pick up again there at verse 23. Here Paul declares, therefore it was necessary that the copies of the things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these, for Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Not that he should offer himself often as the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood of another, he then would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, once at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Here in these verses, we find Paul describing the way that the Lord Jesus 
is acting as our advocate and he's doing this by appearing in the presence of God on our behalf with the cleansing blood of his own sacrifice. In order to show you where I get this, if you would, let's consider the word appear, which is found there in verse 24. There we learn that he is appearing in the presence of God for us. That word appear well, well, it refers to the, the, to the physical manifestation of the incarnation, that's for sure. But it's also used in a legal sense, and it's used of those who appear before the judge in order to, in order to, to report or declare a thing against another person, a, a person who appears in court you know, in order to, to bear legal witness. That's what we're talking about. Luke used this word five times in the book of Acts, and each time he was describing the legal proceedings against Paul, and he was referring to those who appeared before a magistrate to testify against Paul. Thankfully for us, Jesus isn't appearing before God the Father in order to accuse us, but rather to defend us. The Lord Jesus is appearing before God on our behalf. He's acting as our legal advocate. And in order to further grasp the beauty of this truth, if you would hold your place here in the book of Hebrews, I'd like you to turn with me to 1 John chapter 2. As you make your way to 1 John 2, I want to take a moment to point out that some advocates are better than others. If you've ever had to deal with the courts and you've had to hire lawyers or maybe one has been appointed to you, then you quickly recognize that uh, some advocates, some lawyers are better than others. And I'll just point out that there is one lawyer here in Texas who has actually been labeled the worst lawyer ever. Martin Zimmerman is his name, just in case you're wondering. And, and, And according to the records, Martin Zimmerman is the lawyer who ended up being pulled off of his case because he repeatedly dozed off during the trial. How would you like to look over and see your lawyer asleep, you know, as you're dealing with this court case? Man, that would just be a bummer. Not only that, but he forgot his client's name. And, and, and what's even worse is that he forgot to enter a plea bargain, which would have spared his client 20 years in jail. His client ended up spending 20 more years in jail simply because his lawyer was just that bad. In light of this, I'm happy to tell you that our advocate is the best advocate we could have. The Lord Jesus knows our name. He's not going to forget our name. And he's certainly not going to fall asleep (laughs) as our case is being presented. And, and what's even better, listen, he's already secured our forgiveness. He's already secured our pardon. Let's consider how John puts it here in 1 John chapter 2. If you would look with me beginning at verse 1. Here John writes, My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. As we consider what John is saying here, we can rest in the relief of knowing that the Lord Jesus is our righteous advocate. He is our incredible advocate. He is the best lawyer ever. And listen, that's really good news, especially as we consider the fact that the devil is the accuser who accuses us night and day before God. The devil is constantly going to God the Father saying, hey, look at your people down here. Look at, and listen, you know, the devil's a big liar. But he doesn't have to lie about this. He doesn't have to lie when he tells God the Father about us. We definitely give him enough to accuse us of. And knowing that there is a devil standing before God the Father accusing us, I'm happy to tell you that the Lord Jesus is defending us before the Father. And what's even better is that his defense is rock solid. The reason why? Well, it's based on the fact that he's already appeased the judicial requirements of the law on our behalf. And he did this through the propitiatory sacrifice of himself. This is precisely the point that Paul was making in Romans chapter 3. There, Paul assures his audience that God sent Jesus as a propitiation or appeasing sacrifice by his blood through faith. 
to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So more simply put, the Lord Jesus is the best advocate that we could have and the reason why is due to the fact that he's already appeased God the Father. He's already fulfilled the righteous requirements of the law on our behalf, and he did this by paying the price for our sins through his substitutionary sacrifice. And now, those who trust in Jesus, we can take great courage in the fact that we have a righteous advocate. We have the most uh, powerful advocate in, in the entire universe, and he is able to redeem us from every lawless deed. And the reason why is because he's already put our sins away. He's already put them away. In order to further grasp this incredible truth, let's make our way back to Hebrews 9. I want to draw your attention again there to verse 24. Here again, Paul tells us that Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself. He's there in heaven now appearing in the presence of God for us. Not that he should offer himself often as the high priest enters the most holy place every year with the blood of another. The high priest had to go into the Holy of Holies once a year in order to atone for the sins of the people. And he had to go over and over and over again because it was just a temporary sacrifice which could only provide temporary atonement. But the Lord Jesus has offered a better sacrifice. He's not suffering often since the foundation of the world, but once, verse 26, at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. It's one sacrifice for all time, and it's accomplished the work. It's important to understand, though, that the Greek word, which is translated appeared there at the end of verse 26, it isn't the same exact Greek word that he was using back in verse 24. They, sh they share a root in the Greek. But, but in this case, the Greek word that Paul was using in verse 26 speaks of the manifestation of something that was previously hidden. There's information that was previously hidden or unknown, and now it's being manifest. Kind of like when you consider this in the context of a courtroom scene. It's just kind of like, you know, all of a sudden some last minute evidence comes to light. And it's just like, dun, 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 here it is. You know, this proves the point. Imagine for a moment the devil stepping forward in order to accuse us before God the Father and he's telling all the true things about us and, and, and we're definitely guilty. And in our defense, the Lord Jesus steps forward and demands that that list of sins be stricken from the record and he does this by revealing that our sins are entirely immaterial and inadmissible evidence. Think about that for a moment. The whole list of sins that the devil presents against us, it's inadmissible evidence. In order to understand why, it'll help you to know that the sins of the Christian have become inadmissible evidence and the reason why is based on the fact that our advocate has nullified our guilt and he did this because he's already served our death sentence there on that Roman cross. Now, if he's already served our death sentence, then uh, you know, the, 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 the ransom's been paid. Justice has been satisfied. Our debt to God has been paid and therefore the information cannot be brought up against us and, and, and if it is, it's stricken from the record. In light of this, we must understand that the accusations that the devil makes against us, like I said, they're completely correct and yet there should be no doubt in our minds that we are completely deserving of the death penalty and, and, and you know what, if, if that were true of, of of you and I were a lawyer and you came to me and I saw you, hey, you're guilty of this and you know you want me to be your lawyer. It's just kind of like, yeah, I can't take that case because you're going to lose. You're guilty. The Lord Jesus could take that approach with us and just say, you know, you're guilty. You deserve the death penalty. There's nothing, nothing I can do for you, but he doesn't do that. Instead, he becomes our advocate. We have an advocate who is not only willing to take our lost cause case, but he also steps forward to serve our sentence for us through his substitutionary sacrifice. And in this way, he has legally put away our sins by paying our ransom so that those who trust in him can be redeemed through the remission of sins. 
And listen, this redemption not only results in our judicial justification, but it also uh, results in our spiritual sanctification. And in order to explain what I mean by this, hold your place here in the book of Hebrews. I'd like you to turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And as you make your way to the sixth chapter of 1 Corinthians, I want to take a moment to point out that the word sanctification, it simply speaks of something that has been set apart for the service of God. And and so uh, consider uh, the, the motion of these two actions where the Lord Jesus comes and through his death puts away our sins and then sets us apart from them. He's put our sins away from us and he's set us apart from our sins. It's like a double action there. He's removed us from the guilt of our sins and then he takes us and he begins to walk us away from all of those sins. This sanctification, this setting apart is actually the way in which the Lord takes us from the sinners we were on the day of salvation and he begins to transform our lives, changing us into the people that we ought to become. This word sanctification refers to the way in which the Lord Jesus changes the lives of those who trust in him. And while it's true that the Lord has appeared to put away our sins, it's also true that the redemption that we receive by faith in him results in our separation from sin as we begin to walk in his righteousness. Let's consider how Paul puts it here in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. If you would look with me beginning at verse 9 where he asks, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the spirit of our God. Here in these verses, we find Paul helping the Christians there in Corinth to understand that the Lord Jesus uh, not only justifies us through redemption, but he also sanctifies us. He sets us apart from those sins that we used to enjoy. And listen, you might be able to see yourself in that list of sins, or maybe that's who you were. But in Christ, that's no longer us. Positionally, we're no longer guilty of these things. And practically, through sanctification, the Lord begins to change us. The Lord Jesus not only put away our sins on a judicial level, but he also sanctifies us so that we can begin to walk in the righteousness of our Redeemer. Therefore, those who have been redeemed by faith in Jesus, we are now dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord so that we can say such were we? we? We were like this, but no longer because we've been redeemed by the blood of the lamb. Now this brings us to our third point because listen, the, the ransom of redemption not only results in our judicial justification and the ransom of redemption not only results in our spiritual sanctification, but the ransom of redemption also results in our physical glorification. And with this as our focus, let's make our way back to Hebrews 9 where we find Paul. He's continuing to describe the way in which the believer will be saved through redemption. And this is a salvation that is not only present tense, but also future tense. If you would look with me again there at verse 27, we'll pick up our study at verse 27 where Paul declares, and as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment, so Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. Now, Here in the final verses of this chapter, we find Paul, he's helping us Hebrew audience to understand that our death is not the end of our story. Our death is not the end of our story. And the reason why this is such an important point to make is due to the fact that that Paul recognized that that there was a doctrinal division there amongst the Jews and and some Jews sided with the the Pharisees, some with the Sadducees, and and knowing that there may have been uh, some first century Hebrew believers who had come out of the camp of the Sadducees, uh, Paul recognized that they may have had a, a, an issue with the idea of uh, a, a afterlife and resurrection and these sorts of things. You see, the, the Sadducees rejected the doctrine of the resurrection. As a matter of fact, it's in Acts 20, uh, chapter 23, there Luke tells us that the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection and no angel or spirit, while the Pharisees con- uh, confess both. 
The Sadducees, this was this religious sect of Jews who didn't believe in the afterlife. They didn't believe in the resurrection. They didn't believe that they would be able to go to heaven and be with God forevermore. And so they called them the Sadducees because they were sad, you see. Horrible. And so Paul realized that there might be some former Sadducees reading this epistle, and, and with that being the case, it made sense for him to take this time to, to present a case for the resurrection, that it, it's appointed to men to, to live once and then die, and then the judgment. In other words, there's going to be a judgment after death, which means that there must be a resurrection. And listen, not only was Paul making a case for the resurrection, but he was also denying the doctrine of reincarnation. And you better believe that there were people who believed in reincarnation at this point in time, just like there are uh, today, I'm sure we all know someone who believes in the doctrine of reincarnation. But if you don't know what I'm talking about, it'll help you to know that uh, reincarnation is based on this belief that the death of the body releases the soul so that it might be reborn into another body. And there are many people in the world today who believe in reincarnation. They believe that they have had past lives and that they were, you know, some king or queen or whatever the case is. And Paul here is clearly presenting a case against reincarnation. According to Paul, there is no such thing as, as reincarnation. And listen, I could, I could deal with reincarnation just on a mathematical level. Mathematics proves that there's no such thing as reincarnation. I mean, just look at you know, the ants you know, that you find all throughout the world. There's more ants in the world today than there were uh, you know, a thousand years ago. Ant populations have, have, have and so have uncled, uh, uncle populations have also exploded. So, you know, just aunts and uncles are just, you know, they're, it's just the worst, isn't it? Just, <laughs> but I, seriously, there, there are more people on the planet today than there were a thousand years ago. Where do all these souls come from? Mathematically, reincarnation doesn't work. Biblically, reincarnation doesn't work either. And, and those who claim to be Christians and believing in reincarnation, uh, you can't make a biblical case for it. And uh, clearly, Paul is saying here, that, look, you're going to live once. It's appointed for you to live once. And after this life is the judgment. And knowing that there is a judgment to come, well, those who trust in Jesus Christ can rejoice in knowing that we will be saved from the wrath of God. As a matter of fact, look with me again. Uh, if you look with me again there at verse 27, it's, it says that uh, it's appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. See, Jesus isn't going to come back either and, and die over and over and over again, you know, for the sins of more people. No, he died once for the sins of the people. He's offered himself once to bear the sins of many. And, and listen, that word bear is translated from a Greek word which was used of the priests who would bear or carry the sacrificial animal to the altar. They bore the animal uh, all the way to the altar where they offered it to the Lord. And, and not only that, but also uh, the sacrificial lamb would bear or carry the guilt of the people as it was being offered to the Lord. And not only that, but the sins of the people, uh, you know, were spoken over the, the scapegoat and then the scapegoat would be, would be released and that scapegoat also symbolically carried or bore the sins of the people out of the camp. And Jesus fulfilled all of these uh, symbol, symbols of the Old Testament. Jesus was the high priest who bore himself to the altar. He carried his cross and he went and offered himself as a sacrifice for sins as the high priest. And also he's the sacrificial lamb who was bearing the sins of the world as he died for our sins on the cross. And also he's the scapegoat who carried our sins in the shield uh, on our behalf. He bore our sins and carried them away from us. That word bear found there. In uh, Hebrews chapter 9, it's the same Greek word that Peter used in 1 Peter chapter 2. It's verse 24 where he tells us that Jesus bore our sins. He carried our sins in his own body on the tree that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. This, of course, is a reference to the prophecy found in Isaiah 53 where the prophet Isaiah says, Surely he has borne our griefs, he has carried our sorrows. Isaiah tells us that the Messiah was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Not only that, but Isaiah tells us that the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Jesus carried our iniquity because the Father laid our iniquity on him while he was there on the cross. 
It's in this way that God the Father has paid our ransom and he's posted our bail, so to speak. He's done this through the sacrifice of his only begotten son. He's paid our ransom with the blood of his son. And not only did the Lord Jesus uh, purchase our redemption by paying for our sins so that we could be redeemed through justification and through sanctification, but he's also paved the way, he's made a way for us to be redeemed through the prophetic promise of physical glorification. Or in other words, the Lord Jesus not only bore our sins by carrying them off to Sheol through his physical death, but he's also prepared a way. He's paved the path for us to enter into the presence of God through his physical resurrection. Therefore, the ransom of redemption includes the prophetic promise of physical glorification. And I want to consider how Paul puts it here in Hebrews chapter 9. If you would look with me again there at verse 28. Here Paul declares, Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. Now, here in this verse, Paul prophetically points to the moment when the born-again believer finds themselves in the presence of our Savior who here uh, will appear again. Paul assures us he's going to appear a second time. Jesus himself made the same promise. I'll remind you, it was during his earthly ministry that the Lord assured his, his disciples that he was going to go away, that they, were, they weren't going to see him anymore. But then says, hey, I'm going to come back for you. In John 14, Jesus assured his disciples that they would see him again by declaring, a little while and the world will see me no more, but you will see me because I live, you will live also. I'm going to go away for a time. I'm going to go away for a season, but I'm going to appear again and you'll be with me. As we consider Jesus' prophetic promise to appear again, I, I should point out that the timing of the Lord's second appearance, well, it can vary uh, based on uh, circumstances. And just to explain what I mean, let's consider what Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. There he declares, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Now, yesterday, Brenda and I went uh, to uh, the funeral of an old friend. He, he's a believer that I've known for many, many years. I, I met him when I first became a Christian. And, uh, you know, I haven't seen him in years, but after hearing a, a, about his death, you know, I, uh, I went to the funeral just to uh, you know, grieve and celebrate with the fam family. And, and yet I know that he was a Christian. And, and, and he passed away last week. And I know on that day, the second appearance of Jesus happened for him. Why? How do I know that? Well, because to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord for the born again believer. And so when he passed away on that day, in that moment, the second appearance of Jesus happened for him. He was there in the presence of Jesus Christ. And the Lord's second appearance is going to occur at the very moment when the born-again believer dies and enters into heaven. At the same time, though, there's coming a day when the church itself is going to be raptured. We're going to be caught up to meet the Lord in the, in the clouds. And, and if we're fortunate enough to be here at that very moment, then the second appearance of Christ is going to happen at that moment, uh, at the time of the rapture. We will find ourselves instantly in the twinkle of an eye, standing there in the presence of Jesus Christ at the time of the rapture. And I, 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 I hope that happens today. I would love that this would be the day, you know, that we would just be caught up and, and, and the second appearance of Christ would just happen today. But uh, there's going to be a point in time when the rapture happens and the church will experience the second appearance of Jesus at that moment. And, and those who uh, are still remain or are left behind or those who are born during the time of tribulation, well, the second appearance of Christ for them is going to happen at the time of the second coming. All of this to say that the second appearance of the Lord Jesus could be different depending on the person and the circumstances. But regardless of which camp uh, you know, a person ends up in, Paul assures us here that those who are eagerly waiting for this time when the second appearance of Jesus Christ occurs, uh, those who trust in Jesus uh, can rest in the assurance of the salvation that he secured for us when he paid the ransom for our redemption. And just to be clear, we should understand that the Greek word, which is found there at the end of verse 28, it's rendered salvation. Uh, that word salvation refers to the future salvation, which includes the sum and total of benefits and blessings which the Christians uh, who are redeemed from this earth will enjoy after the visible return of Christ from heaven in the consummated and eternal kingdom of God. Or, or just to put that simply, that word salvation, it fully encompasses Everything from justification through sanctification all the way to our glorification. 
And in order to further grasp the point that Paul is making, I, I w- I'd like you to turn in your Bibles to the third chapter of John's first epistle. Let's turn in our Bibles to 1 John chapter 3. And as you're turning to 1 John 3, I want to take a moment to point out that those of us who are eagerly waiting to see Jesus, if that's your greatest desire and you're eagerly waiting to to stand in the presence of Jesus Christ, well, you can rejoice in knowing that there's going to be a total transformation of our physical bodies before we find ourselves in his presence. I really can't describe what that even looks like. I I can't explain what our, our new physique is going to be like. But what I can tell you is that our glorified bodies will be just like our saviors. Let's consider how the apostle John puts it here in 1 John chapter 3. If you would look with me there beginning at verse 1, here John declares, behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. We're going to be like Jesus, Christian. Well, I can't exactly tell you what that looks like or or what that is going to be like. What I do know is that we're going to be transformed into perfect beings, just like our Savior is a perfectly glorified being. And it's possible that you know, you're struggling with, you know, some physical infirmity here in this world. And I'm pretty certain that I could, uh, that I could guess that we're all struggling somehow, physically speaking. You know, some of us might have more pain than others. But listen, I, I guarantee the, the fallen bodies that we have right now, uh, they weren't designed to last forever. Uh, we have a fallen body and therefore we wake up with back pains and, you know, uh, it's all going to be gone. In the twinkling of an eye, we're going to be transformed into glorified bodies and we're never going to wake up with back pain. You know, we're never going to have, Brenda's never going to have to wake up and look at this face again. You know, it's going to, it's going to be a much more beautiful face. You know, it's, I know, I know, it's hard to imagine, but it's true. It's going to, we're all headed for an upgrade, Christian. And that's good news. We're headed for an incredible upgrade and I'm eagerly waiting for the day when I will see Jesus face to face. I hope you are too. At the same time, though, we should consider what John wrote next because, you know, while this gives us hope for the future, the question is, well, what should we do with this information today? And John tells us here in 1 John chapter 3. Look with me there at verse 3. He says, and everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Christian, listen, the promise of eternal glorification in the future resurrection doesn't mean, oh, just do whatever you want today now. This isn't a blank check to just go back and live in sin. This isn't just, you know, a a license to sin so that you can just say, well, I'm going to be forgiven and I'm going to be glorified. So it really doesn't matter if I live in sin today. Well, no, listen, if you really have hope in Jesus, then that hope will be demonstrated in the fact that you will want to live a life that is pleasing to him. And listen, if you have no desire to live a life that's pleasing to the Lord Jesus Christ, then I have to question, are you really saved? Do you really eagerly wait for his second coming? Do you really have hope in Jesus Christ? Because if so, you will want to live a life that is pleasing to him. While it's true that the born-again believer can rest in the realization that the Father has secured our redemption by paying our ransom, it's also true that those who have been redeemed by faith ought to live a life that is pleasing to the Lord. Unlike that Chinese college student who wasn't really sure if his father loved him, I'm here to tell you that the born-again believer can be certain that God the Father loves us with an everlasting love. Jesus even assured us of this fact when he revealed that God's love for us is what led him to pay the ransom for our redemption. As a matter of fact, it's in John chapter three where the Lord Jesus declares, God so loves the world that he gave us his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. In light of this, we can rest in the assurance of knowing that we have a heavenly father who loves us with an everlasting love. 
We don't have to wonder like Zhu, the Chinese student who faked his own you know, kidnapping in order to try to find out of his father. We don't have to go through all of this. All we have to do is look at Jesus Christ and know that God the Father loves us. And he loves us so much that he was willing to sacrifice his only begotten son so that sinners like us could be redeemed. In this way, the father shed the blood of his only begotten son to pay for the ransom of our redemption, which results in our judicial justification. It results in our spiritual sanctification as well as our physical glorification. And so with that, those who repent and receive by faith the free gift of God's grace, we can rejoice in knowing that we have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. We can rejoice in knowing that those who have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, well, we will continue to receive the love of God the Father today, tomorrow, and forevermore.